And what Hamilton suggests really sticks with us and then actually becomes a style for communicating mathematics, writing mathematics, and teaching mathematics. And I'll just make one comment that I think we've way overreached with Hamilton's approach. His rigorization was a very necessary thing in the middle of 19th century. But that doesn't mean that that's the way to think about things or a way to teach things. So I think we went way too far. But here's what he said. He said, a complex number is a pair of reals, is a couple of real numbers. Here is a complex number, and we will write them thus. Yes, this represents A plus BI, but in this way we don't even need to write I. We will now think of complex numbers as pairs of real numbers. And you guys, I think, accept this sort of thing without a problem. Because you're used to linear algebra, most of linear algebra is based on this sort of thing. We consider n-tuples of numbers, we call it Rn, without any problem. But I think back then it was probably revolutionary. And it seemed like the part that was problematic, which is I, was removed. And in a sense it was. And, in, and when we add it to another complex number, we do it according to this rule. And now you also have to introduce multiplication. And he said, here's the rule, I'm postulating it. According to my rule, when you multiply this complex number by this one, the result is another pair. Well, we know what it is. It will be AC minus BD. And this, of course, it's completely clear where this comes from, right? Because when you multiply A plus BI by C plus DI, you get AC minus BD times I AD plus BC. So what he does is introduce this new type of object, a pair of numbers, which for us seems easier to accept as something that exists, and then proceeds to postur postulate rules, which he knows will work out perfectly because of all the work that came before. Okay. And so all of the confusion is removed. There is no square root, there is no minus one, there is no square root of minus one. There is perfect mathematical rigor at the expense of basically taking away all of the intuition and all of the liveliness and all of the brilliance of notation out of it. And it also doesn't make it seem like real numbers are part of complex numbers. Except you need to realize that if you take a number of the kind a comma zero and you multiply it by the number b comma zero and you use this rule I'm sorry, I'm going to use C here just to line them up. C comma zero, and you use this rule, you get one minus zero, comma, zero plus zero. So you get AC comma zero. And so numbers of this kind, while well, they're clearly closed under addition, they're also closed under multiplication, as this shows, because you get another number following this rule. And so this subset of these numbers looks like real numbers in a way. And so real numbers are kind of mixed in here, but in this rather awkward way. And now if we total sticklers for this notation, instead of writing an equation, as you're about to see, that's now possible to solve. If we were total sticklers for Hamilton's notation, we now would have to write this. Okay, because now, there's no such thing as real numbers. We only have pairs of real numbers, so everything needs to be written as pairs of real numbers. So if you are uncompromising about the approach, this is what you need to do. And this clearly has a solution, and that solution is 0, 1. 
because 0 comma 1 squared, let's, well, we'll see this in a second. 1 comma 0 equals 0 comma 0. Let's see this. 0, 1 squared, according to this definition, equals 0 minus 1, ha uh ha, -huh. and then AD, 0 plus 0, minus 1, 0. And so you see that it works. So we're given this, so this approach gives us this very, very, let's start with the positives, rigorous world where you can't really question anything. Although in mathematics, whenever you feel like there is nothing left to question, it's probably an illusion. So that's what's usually happening. Whenever you feel like, oh, we've answered all the questions and we have found a, at the ultimate starting point, it's an illusion. You spend a little bit more time and you realize it's self-contradictory on a more profound level. And I'm sure Hamilton realized it much better. Uh, but in any case, at least we don't have to deal with the square root of negative, at least we never have to say square root of negative one. At least we now have perfectly understandable quantities if you accept pairs of numbers whose square clearly, well I cannot call say that this is minus one, right? So, so there's that, you know, something that's not perfect, but it solves the complex equivalent of this equation. So you can't say that this equation now has a solution because this equation now doesn't exist anymore. It has to be this solution. So you sacrifice a lot of fluidity in exchange for, let's call it, perfect rigor. So I'm mentioning this because it's important, especially in this day and age, to have this in the back of your mind, that there is rigor and that's the way to do it, and it's not such a big price to have in order to remove, let's say, all data. So this is what's in the background, but let's also be reasonable about it and use Euler's notation and write this quantity, this pair of numbers, as a plus bi, where i serves several functions. Let me write this and then I'll talk about it. The symbol i serves a number of very important functions. Number one, it's the placeholder. It tells us that whatever it multiplies is the second number in the pair. And it gives us the flexibility to write a, when we mean a comma zero, It, allows, it also allows us to write this as bi plus a, so we don't have to pay so much attention to the order because this placeholder, this symbol tells us that whatever it multiplies is the second pair in the number. That's another nice feature. It also allows us to write bi when we mean the pair 0b. Yet another function of the symbol i is to remind us of that formula for multiplying complex numbers that looks, I've erased it, so cumbersome that has ac minus bd plus ad plus bc, not plus, comma, ad plus bc, that formula. But here, if we use i, then what we're allowed to do is to follow the rules of algebra, and whenever i meets i, we replace it with minus 1. And you can, one by one, make sure that all of these rules correspond exactly to the objects and the rules for manipulating them that Hamilton suggested. Okay, so, for the sake of being rigorous, to us, a complex number is what it was to Hamilton a pair of numbers, and that removes, for now, until we begin to extract square roots, all conundrums having to do with square root of minus one doesn't exist. But we're not going to use Hamilton's notation. 
And I don't think he really did. Because the advantage of this is so great that there is no way that, not even for a minute, we won't use this notation. So now let's talk about some of the very basic properties of complex numbers. And maybe just for the first one, that's non-trivial, <coughs> I'll use both notations side by side. So here's the two things that are completely trivial. It's the fact that, actually it's a matter of definition, that these numbers can be added together, and when I say numbers, I mean objects, but yeah, we're going to call them numbers. Right? Which is already a little interesting, isn't it? That we look at this and call it a number. Right? Even though it's a pair. But it's a number. We're going to call it a number. They work just like numbers. Their sum is another number of the same kind. Their product is another number of the same kind. Just like we did when we talked about a rational plus square root of 5 times another rational. Remember we made those two assertions? that the sum of two numbers of that kind is another number of the same kind, and the product of those two numbers is another number of the same kind. And the next question was, well, what about the inverse? <coughs> Can we divide by complex numbers? So, in Hamilton's notation, we have got to write this as a pair of numbers. This right now does not appear as a pair of numbers. But we need to come up with a number. So basically, what this number is, is a number that solves the equation x, where x is a pair, a number in the sense that it's a pair, times a comma b equals 1 comma 0. Okay. That's what we're looking for. That's what 1 over a b means. It's the solution to this equation. In Euler's notation, it's 1 divided by a plus ib, or bi, doesn't matter, obviously. Okay. And I just think that when you look at this, all of you given a little bit of experience, or great experience that you have with complex numbers, you know exactly what to do. You're going to multiply the, both the numerator and the denominator, you're going to multiply both the numerator and the denominator by a minus ib. Which is wonderful. You can't think of a more wonderful combination of two numbers, a and b. You guys agree with me? So you see these complex numbers, they really pay you back for your willingness to use them with just an enormous amount of beauty. And here we have a minus ib, which I'm not going to do it because in this notation I don't have to, can be broken up into a divided by a squared plus b squared minus i times b divided by a squared plus b squared. So it's that pair. Here, you cannot use any of that intuition. You just have to be Brilliant to know to multiply both the top and the bottom by a minus b i, excuse me, by a comma minus b. Okay, and then following the rules laid out by Hamilton, on the bottom we have a squared plus b squared comma zero, and on top we have a minus b, a comma, minus b, and now you have to realize that from Hamilton's point of view, you shouldn't even write 1 divided by a comma b, you should really write 1 comma 0 divided by a comma b. So by writing just 1, see here I wrote it correctly, but when I wrote just 1 here, I was already allowing myself some freedom of Shorthand notation, when I wrote 1, I really meant 1 comma 0. Okay, so the result is both whatever notation that you use, but of course we're going to use this notation. And if you recall, thinking back to last week, 
When we did this with numbers of the kind a plus square root of 5b, on the bottom we ended up with a squared minus 5b squared, which had a minus sign, and yes, we got lucky that with rational a and b that number could not have been zero, but here this issue doesn't even arise. It's even better. So complex numbers are even better than these numbers. You just have the sum of squares, which is just perfect. Doesn't get any better than that. Okay? And so this shows that complex numbers form a field. There's addition, there's multiplication that satisfies all of the usual rules like commutativity, distributivity, associativity, everything. And every, every non-zero number, and by zero we mean the pair zero, zero, the additive zero. So every number other than, that's not zero has a well-defined inverse. And I guess at this point, we should also introduce the conjugate. The conjugate, A plus BI, and the notation for the conjugate is the bar, and it's defined as A minus BI. So this is called, these numbers are called complex numbers, I guess I should have said that. And, well, let, let me throw out some notation. This is called a complex number. A is called the real part. B is called the imaginary part. The complex conjugate is another pair where the real part is the same and the, and the imaginary part is opposite of the imaginary part of the original number. <coughs> And complex conjugate is in some ways kind of an ugly operation because the operations that we will prefer greatly are the operations where you can just treat the number as a whole integral unit without necessarily zooming in onto the real and imaginary parts. Those will be the best. For example, if you call this pair Z, which is commonly done, Z is a common letter to use, we can talk about z squared, 1 over z. Uh, next time we'll talk about e to the z, and then log z, and then cosine of z, and sine of z, inverse powers of z, z to the n. We want to talk about complex numbers as much as possible as integral, indivisible units where you don't have to zoom in at the level of real and imaginary parts. But the complex conjugate really requires you to zoom in at that level and break up the number into the real and imaginary part. So from that point of view, it's kind of an ugly operation, but it is completely indispensable and will appear all the time. So the next question that occurred with these kinds of numbers, and I'll just pose it and we'll answer it tomorrow, is the question of extracting roots of these numbers. And the big question was, if we take the cubic root of a number like this, will this be another number of the same kind where x and y were rational? And the answer at that point was an inkling, but I think it's pretty clear that that's just not the case. For instance, I think that if a is 0 and b is 1, I think it's pretty clear that the cubic root of square root of 5 is not a rational plus square root of 5 and another rational. I think it's relatively clear. We can think about it. But basically, these numbers were flawed and that you couldn't really extract roots and get another and express them in the same form as the original number. So the roots, this was a set not closed undertaking roots. Well, complex numbers remove all problems associated with that, and they are, when it comes to extracting roots of complex numbers, everything works perfectly. 